Well, hello there everyone, UXW Bill here once again. It's time for part two of the Samsung SyncMaster 203B monitor repair. When last I spoke about this monitor in the video immediately prior to this one, I had done a power on test only to find that it did not work. And when I subsequently removed the power supply board, I discovered copious quantities of bad capacitors. Now, since that time, someone told me that I should also check this fusistor or fusible resistor over here on the circuit board at position F301 to make sure that it was not open and although I have never had one of those fail before in this case it did fail and I don't actually have one of those on hand well maybe I do I've got another Samsung monitor power supply board laying around down here someplace I may check it and see if that fusible resistor is good because it really wouldn't be a very good idea to just bypass that in case there is a circuit fault further on down the line, which there may or may not be. I, I don't know. I may have a temporary leave of my senses and decide just to jump her across that thing. After all, I've got nothing in this monitor, and while I don't advocate uh, doing things that are dangerous or likely to result in senseless destruction of perfectly good stuff, I really would like to see if this monitor is going to come back to life without having to wait for another one of those fusible resistors to arrive. Speaking of things that have arrived, I've got my replacement capacitors right here. A couple of the, um, let's see here, what do we have? We have 25 volts at 820 microfarads. We have, this is a small one, it's going to be hard to read. This is a 47 microfarad at 50 volt capacitor. And then this is a 330 microfarad at 25 volt capacitor. So that's replacements for almost everything on this board. I'm going to leave the big filter cap in place because as I said previously, unless I know for sure that one of these is bad, I usually don't bother replacing them. And despite the stress that they are under in one of these switch mode power supplies, I have only rarely seen these fail. Unfortunately, one of the capacitors that I did not get a replacement for, and I suppose I just forgot it, is this little guy right here. What's that say? I think that says 10 microfarads. Yeah, it's really kind of hard to read because it's right there on the edge of the can at 50 volts. And I might have some of those upstairs, but I know I got to thinking since I've repaired other Samsung monitor power supplies in the past that I also had these other capacitor values upstairs, and that did not turn out to be the case. Well, I'm waiting for my soldering iron to warm up, and while I'm waiting for that to happen, and before I go ahead and pause the camera and actually remove all these bad capacitors from the board, I do want to talk about the word soldering. You see, there are some people out there in the world who have helpfully pointed out with uh, helpful surrounded by scare quotes, I guess you could say, that there is an L in solder, as though I did not know that. Well, maybe in some places in the world you do pronounce the L, but here in the United States of America, I've never heard anyone pronounce the L in solder. So maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong, but you know what? I don't really care. I don't feel like being all that conciliatory about it, and I'm sure that you have better things to do in your life than to rag on one random YouTuber for the fact that he didn't pronounce something exactly to your liking. So this is pretty much my final comment on that subject. <laughs> I'm covered in solder. Okay, let's go ahead and get ready to do this here. I think both of those irons have warmed up. So I'm going to go ahead and get the desoldering iron and remove these from here. And for those of you in the audience who are wondering why I don't go ahead and show that on video, well, as I've said in the past, I don't really intend for this to be a strict how-to guide, and I do not consider myself to be an adequate source of instruction on the practice of soldering. If you need to know how to do that, you can find several good tutorials and even some videos online. You can also watch other videos where I have done some soldering in the past, such as the uh, Technics SA946 receiver repair video, as well as the Sony mini disc repair series. All right, well, I'm in the midst of removing some of the old capacitors from the board here. As you can see, there are now a couple of empty positions on the board that weren't there previously. I thought I'd take a moment and point something out that might be very handy to know for those of you who are contemplating doing this kind of repair on your own. However, I must urge you that if you do consider such a repair, you should take great care to understand what the basic functions of components in an electronic circuit such as this are, and you should also take great pains to not underestimate 
your own safety because no electronic device is worth your life, health, or well-being. So if you don't know how to repair something and you don't understand what things are doing in a given circuit on at least a basic level, it would be in your best interest not to repair things. But that's not really what I wanted to point out. You'll notice that on the circuit board here, there's a shaded area where the capacitors were once located. That is because most electrolytic capacitors, and certainly the ones used in this circuit, are polarized. You can see that there is a marking for the negative side of the capacitor right here, and the other leg, of course, which is positive. And all, most all, electrolytic capacitors have those. There are some so-called non-polarized capacitors. They usually see use in speaker crossover networks and things like that. But in a circuit like this, what you're going to see are polarized electrolytic capacitors, and it's vitally important that you reinstall these correctly. If you get them reversed, they will in all likelihood explode. Now, it's not really likely to harm anything, but it certainly could lead to a couple of minutes being shaved off of your life. And along that regard, you cannot always count on the printed circuit board outline and artwork to be correct, because it isn't always. I have come across some circuit boards where there is either a design or marking error across the entire board or in certain places. So the best thing to do, if you have any question at all, is to simply go ahead and make a note of how the capacitors were installed, because the manufacturers do at least usually get that right. I would also definitely recommend that when you remove and replace components on the board that you do only one component at a time so that you don't lose track of what goes where or that you draw out some sort of a schematic and a component placement diagram so that you know for absolutely certain where things go. But by far and away the least error prone way to do this is to do either just one component at a time or all of the like components at a time just like I have done with all of these identically valued electrolytic capacitors. With these installed, I'll go ahead and trim the leads and then I'll go ahead and put the other couple of capacitors that I have in at which point I will then look around and see if I can find a replacement for this little 10 microfarad 50 volt fellow right next to that white thermoplastic connector on the board. And then I will have to reach a decision about this thing. Okay, after a little bit of work I'm back and as you can see I've got the monitor here on my uh, pool table turned workbench because it's really all it's good for anymore. I've actually got the power supply board to hand here and I have cleaned up all the uh, long capacitor leads. I've trimmed them down to size and of course now I'll have to pick them up. All the little scraggles of uh, leads that are laying around here and things like that. I've gone ahead and decided to do something, oh well it's more than a little bit rash. As you can see I've actually jumpered across that fuse with a piece of wire. Now earlier I, ident I identified that piece as being a fusistor and that's actually not correct. I guess I can blame it on being up late at night because usually I start to jumble my terms after a while. It's actually a 3 amp 125 volt pico fuse for which I have gone ahead and ordered the correct replacement. They really are very cheap and I would never recommend that anyone do this. This is not a good idea, okay? I've said in the past on my various videos that I am a bad example and never was that truer than what you're seeing here. Bypassing fuses and devices is something that you should never ever ever do unless you are extremely very vehemently sure of your ground and that you know how to deal with the consequences such as they might be. You probably can't be sure enough. But I'm a big boy. I know how to take responsibility for my own actions, and I very strongly believe that for a short duration test, since the bad capacitors are in all likelihood what caused that fuse to blow in the first place, and there's likely to be no other problem with this power supply board, that it, it should be all right for a short duration test. But like I said, I have gone ahead and ordered the proper parts. So we'll just have a very quick run up. I don't even know that I'll bother hooking this display up to the computer. I'll just see if it powers up and displays the indication that it's searching for a signal and then I will very probably turn it off because there is absolutely no protection for certain parts of this circuit right now. And you know that Samsung opted to put a fuse there because someone at Samsung thought it was important. Unfortunately, they did not ascribe the same importance to using high quality capacitors. Now, if you do something like this yourself, you definitely want to take the opportunity to go over your work once again, make sure your components are properly installed, 
Make sure that you don't have any uh, bridges in your solder joints. Mine actually look pretty good if I can find them here on the board. <laughs> and, you know, just check everything over and make sure that you did it right. And if you think you did it right, well, guess what? It's time to go ahead and power it up. So I'm going to go ahead and put the board back into the monitor here alongside the uh, image processing board. And we're going to power it up and just see what happens. All right, everybody, here we go. It's time for the grand run-up, see if this thing has actually recovered itself to life after that uh, little bit of capacitor replacement there. I mentioned in the first video that although I've had some devices blow up on me in the past or start smoking or doing other fun things like that, it's really not the kind of thing I enjoy. I also don't enjoy it when there's a loud pop and the room gets plunged into darkness because... I just took out a fuse or popped a circuit breaker or something along those lines. So I've definitely mentioned that I'm a bit of a big chicken. However, I've also had a habit of doing something in the past that many of you have uh, voiced a great deal of support for, and that's yelling smoke test before I go ahead and test a piece of newly repaired electronic equipment. So even though it's about 1.30 in the morning, I'm down here in the basement, I can probably get away with it, so <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Smoke test! Alright, well nothing blew up. Didn't turn itself on. I wonder if I've got the switch on at the back. Well, let's push the power button and see. Alright! It is alive! We have backlighting. Power light's still a little dim, but hey! I can't really ask for much more than that. That's completely awesome. So let's go ahead and unplug it here, just to play it safe. And I guess I will go ahead and just sneak a quick image from the computer onto it, just to make sure that the screen's not damaged or anything like that, because it definitely looked a little bit rough when I brought it in from the outdoors. So I'll go ahead and try that, and we'll be right back to see the results. Okay, I've got a handy test bench computer here. And I went ahead and made the uh, connection to the video card via DVI because this other panel is uh, VGA only. I noticed something interesting when I went into the Windows screen uh, resolution control panel. And before I'd even plugged this display in, I noticed that the computer had detected its presence and had identified it. So apparently, the computer doesn't, uh, the display doesn't need any power in order to provide uh, data to the operating system. About what's going on, and we do have a picture. So let's see here, 1400 by 1050. And we've got some windows up here on the screen. Let's see if I can go ahead and move one of these to the other screen. See if it actually happens to work. Oh yeah, it does, it's pretty sweet. Got a little bit of spotting or modeling down there. And some dirt that looks to be trapped behind the panel. But that's probably more than I want to get into. Looks like somebody had the brightness on this thing turned up all the way. Someone, I think it was the Tech Knight, had commented that he felt driving the brightness pretty hard on these things was a good way to wear out the power supplies faster. I usually run them around 60 to 70 percent. Of course, it doesn't really help this poor monitor that it's facing the ceiling and getting a lot of glare off the ceiling lights. But it is at least working. And for the most part, it's got an excellent picture. Maybe this is just some water that's trapped behind here. Maybe we could get lucky and that'll, that'll dry out over time because it's not the uh, driest environment down here in the basement. Even though I've got a dehumidifier running, it's still about 40% relative humidity. And I once had, a, once had a mishap up in my bedroom with a flat panel display. I ended up getting up in the night and knocked a cup of water that was on the desk into the face of the display. And although the display survived, it had water spotting behind the panel for the longest time. Now, it did eventually dry out. Looks like I got a couple more back there. But you know, for the price, and the fact that this was not a difficult repair, it's really very hard to complain. So the last thing to do, the last two things to do, will be to get a proper capacitor for that one that I didn't happen to get, and also to install the proper Pico fuse. But for right now, I'd say this monitor is good as repaired, so thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.